Basel III is using the same concepts, but imposes not 2.5%, but 7%, or even more, depending on the nature of the activities and the type of bank. This was the first axis, leading to a considerable increase in the required capital for banks. The second element, Basel III adds, relates to the size of the balance sheet. Last years, we have seen balance sheets of banks growing significantly. Basel III insists on limiting this and even stimulates banks to take initiatives to reduce them. The way to impose this is by putting a limit on the size of the activities a bank can develop compared to its own capital. For this, a leverage ratio has been developed. The third element added by Basel III, and probably the most important one, is liquidity. Liquidity is represented by this bucket. The bucket is not filled up with water, but it represents liquidity. So it contains euros and cents. They stole my bucket theory. What is liquidity to a bank? A bank receives deposits and grants loans. Every day, the bank disposes of a certain level of cash through its activity of collecting deposits and by providing cash to clients while granting loans. It's very likely the bank will not be in equilibrium at the end of the day. If it has more deposits than loans, it will deposit part of them with another bank. If it has granted more loans than it received deposits, it will go for a loan with another bank via the so-called interbanking market. Of course, it's key for a bank to have equilibrium between its loans and deposits for each period of time. To be sure such equilibrium will exist, Basel III has developed a specific regulation. Before zooming in on this, I will first explain the metaphor of the bucket used in this film. As we saw, the bucket fills up with euros and cents. So each time the bank receives a deposit, the bucket will fill up. Each time the bank grants a loan, some liquidity will leave the bucket. Why? Because the related cash will be with the corporate client, with the individual, or with the person who sold a good to this individual. Still, another aspect requires an explanation before we can tackle the regulation itself. The in and outgoing cash flows are very typical to each bank. I can explain this as follows. A savings bank is specialized in the collection of deposits. Its bucket will fill up at high speed and can even have an overflow. At the other end of the spectrum, a merchant bank specialized in lending activities to large corporates will see its buckets emptied at high speed. It's mainly the speed of the bucket filling up and emptying that is typical for each bank. For this, Basel III imposes standardized stress tests on all banks. In fact, Basel III compels banks to have sufficient liquidity available during a period of 30 days of stressed conditions. In normal conditions, one can expect a loan to be reimbursed completely at its maturity date. This is not the case during the stress test window of 30 days. Then only 50% serves to reimburse the bank, and the bank has to inject the other 50% in the economy by granting new loans. So for loans at maturity, 50% leaves the bank again. Let's have a look at the treatment of deposits. The first category is deposits from individuals and from small and medium-sized companies. Basel III states they leave the bank at 5% or 10%. So during the 30-day stress period, 5 or 10% of those deposits will basically walk out the door. For deposits received from banks, the runoff percentage is at 100%, meaning they will leave completely before the end of the stress test. Of course, a third category exists, the one relating to deposits from corporates. Here, a very important notion is introduced by Basel III. 25% or 75% of the deposits of corporates will leave, depending on the existence or non-existence 
of an operational relationship between the bank and the corporate. In other words, if a bank has 10 billion corporate deposits and an operational relationship with these clients, two and a half billion will be lost. Suppose no operational relationship exists. The bank might even lose 7.5 billion of these deposits. The result is a 5 billion difference in the stress test for Basel III. We'll come back on this Basel III tendency to guide banks towards more traditional activities. I have explained that at all times, enough liquidity has to be available to comply with the stress test. This will put pressure on the net results. Remember also that the required increase in the capital must be set aside. So we are dividing something becoming smaller by something becoming larger. This leads to a reduction in return on equity for banks. This is a very tangible Basel III impact on banks. The primary challenge to a bank is the managing of the equilibrium between loans and deposits. This is a fundamental daily challenge that will drive the banks. As I have explained, banks face a profitability challenge. Revenues from cross-selling will be welcome, and on top of this, cross-selling will be required to manage the equilibrium loans deposits. However, this cross-selling also leads to more operational intimacy, the kind of operational relationship we referred to earlier. So, while managing the balance between deposits and loans, cross-selling will also be key. The operational intimacy this will bring will help to retain the required liquidity levels for the stress test. So, this is very fundamental to the required calculations for Basel III, as well as for the continuity of the bank. This leads us to our statement that banks have to have complementary activities to the business of granting loans and collecting deposits. Cash management is a good example. Cash management is key in this context. Factoring is also a complementary activity. The former Fortis factoring entity has now returned to BNP Paribas Fortis to become part of the service offered to our clients. With what you have just seen, I hope I have provided you with an overview of what Basel III is all about, how it impacts banks and the shifts it will bring to the interaction with their clients. This means that banks will work on a closer relationship with their clients and put more emphasis on traditional banking activities. Thank you all for your attention. All right, so comments or questions on that little video. What was your takeaways from it? I know there was some confusing stuff in there that um, Actually, was going to a level of detail, but I hope that it kind of brought in together some of the elements we've seen with balance sheets and exposures and cash and kind of the flow of how a real bank operates. And so thoughts, takeaways? I actually kind of like the overall regulation on it, basically. Basically, it's trying to set up a, a scenario where it's like, okay, you've got enough liquidity to be able to weather all this that you could have to go through. We're not going to have to bail you out again. This is the way that it's going to be. That we had to rescue you once. So right. if you fail now, that's on you. That that's part of it, and and some of that's always been there. So sometimes it's beefing up that, and so the the couple changes that they mentioned in the video of maybe changing those percentages to being a little bit higher. That's again, right. giving that kind of that cash cushion. Which uh, what's the trade? What's the bad part of that? Kind of what I want to kind of call to your attention because the bad part is what leads later to possibly those sorts of regulations being relaxed. So what's the bad part about having a big fat pillow of cash currency to cushion? Currency, it ends up being a currency trade and it's really just the money supply, really just the money supply. Okay, and what's the impact on businesses and interest rates? interest rates go up, right? There's less lending. So if we think about the supply of loanable funds way back to principles class, um, 
there's more if there's more funds being supplied, it'll drive down interest rates. So there is, you know, problems with having too much regulation. So that that's this tension that's always there of I know how to make the banking system really, really, really safe. You know, make the cash cushion this big. But then people say, oh, interest rates are too high, there's too much regulation, and maybe they're right. You know, what is that optimal level of cash cushion? So that's kind of the continual tensions that are out there. Um, okay, anything else take away from the video? All right, so then we're just really scratching the surface on, on a couple things. We'll talk uh, Monday on a little more on FDIC and some other, some other things of what the uh, regulators do when they climb into the books of the banks and, and do some uh, examinations and that sort of thing. So, all right, um, let me park Mr. Camera. So are we going to be tossing the thing back and forth so it can see us? Uh, no. Okay. You know, it uh, it's say but I was thinking about even just turning it off, but I decided what the heck. we like off All right, so. Maybe talks about insurance for that. We like off camera us. I like off camera us just fine. Thank you. Actually, I will tell you, let me talk, this isn't, doesn't need to be off camera, but it is personal. Um, and I meant to bring this up actually, so I'm glad you guys did that. So this is my, uh, I've been carrying this around my pocket, that's why it's almost torn apart. Um, my shoulder was a little wacky. I'll try to keep this brief, but I, I think it brings up some of the topics that we're doing in here and, and otherwise. Um, Shoulder was a little wacky. I had surgery on the shoulder before. I thought something popped. So I'm like, I'm gonna go to the physical therapist and just get an evaluation. It's 35 bucks. I'm like, maybe I'll ride it out, but I'd like to get it checked out. Because if it's screwed and I need to have a surgery, I'll just bite the bullet and maybe go get it done. So um, I checked my Aetna insurance and the nearest physical therapist is Lawrence. And I'm like, well, there's that place right on across the street from Subway. That's physical therapy. So anyway, I do a little digging, find out, oh, it, that physical therapist has run through Ransom, so it didn't show up. But Ransom's in my network of providers, so I go up, set an appointment. I see the physical therapist for 10 minutes tops of actually meeting the physical therapist. They did a couple little, you know, tests, this, you know, the all the stuff that you guys have done with other things. And she says, well, good news. I, I don't think. I don't think there's a tear or anything. I think it's just a, a pop out. I can't remember what she called it. But anyway, um, ride it out for a couple weeks. If for some reason it still bothered me, then come back. But otherwise, I, I'm pretty sure it's just going to ride itself up. Great. Go back. And then, of course, a month later or whatever, I get this little bill for $209, of which my insurance company paid $52.25. So I'm left with $156.75. And I'm like, I swear the insurance was for whether you go to a chiropractor or physical therapist, you know, whatever. So I called them early last week and got the message. And I just talked to this uh, receptionist who handles the books at Ransom an hour and a half ago. And she told me some interesting things that I didn't know about insurance, a couple new things, some of them I knew. Um, so their physical therapy is considered inpatient service or outpatient service or something. It's categorized differently than physical therapy because it's run through the hospital. So it's like I went to Ransom Memorial, I didn't go to a physical therapist because it's run that way. And so that's where the $209 bill came from. Of course, in the back of my mind, I'm like, can you give me a reduction? So I told her the whole, I talked to him for 10 minutes, and I realized that there's other costs, and blah, 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 blah. And so she asked when the deductible was due, and I said it was at the time, and she said, well, I tell you what I can do. Um, I can reduce it $56.75. I'm kind of kicking myself later. I probably should have argued for a little bit more, but whatever at, at this point. So then she told me during the conversation, 
well, we didn't get paid anything by the insurance either, if that makes you feel better, or something like that. And she's real nice. I didn't mean to make that sound negative. But she said, we didn't get paid the, the 5225. And I said, well, what do you mean? She said, well, it says 5225 on your invoice, right? And she said, we didn't get paid that. We just reduced the bill accordingly by the 5225. And I'm like, why is that? And she said, well, it's because of our contract. So you guys, are you familiar with the in-service, or the network provider versus out of network with healthcare? Very normal thing that yeah. they make deals, the big health insurance companies make deals with the local providers. Auto University shops for Aetna for health insurance, and then Aetna strikes deals with the, some local providers, maybe not all of them, but usually a lot of the local places are covered. And, um, so what their deal is, is that when Russ gets billed this, and it looks like this on the bill, we don't have to pay that. That's at this benefit of contracting with Ransom that we will seek them out for their services, right? So that we go through Aetna, you, you tend to pick the, the in-network providers because it's cheaper to you ultimately is, is the healthcare job. So I started scratching my head and I'm like, okay, so at the end of the day, what was the price of these services? After Russ McCullough called in and complained, I got it down to 100, but the bill was 209, Aetna didn't pay, so the price of my healthcare services that particular day was 100, rather than the stated value of 209, right? It's still significantly more than $35 or something like that. Because you're not right, that, that I had planned to pay in the, in the beginning. So you've heard of rising healthcare costs. Part of me wondered, is that based off of the 209? Because the economist in me says that I really only paid 100, which is 50%, less than 50% of the 209 that was stated. And furthermore, even if I would have just said, oh, 156, whatever, I don't understand. I didn't want to call and complain. I paid the 156. Then the rising healthcare cost is still substantially less at 156 compared to the 209 that's stated on the charges. So the economist to me is thinking part of the price is reflecting something in the market to make efficient decisions. This is showing kind of one of those distortions of how part of what might be wrong with the healthcare system in general. So. But you also pay for health insurance, well, not just the premium. Right? The premium, but yeah, yeah, there's health insurance premium. Right. <coughs> I was gonna say, so you have the health insurance and other people, they didn't pay anything out on your on the payment, they just struck a deal more or less. And if you didn't have the health insurance, so you would have been paying the full million dollars had you not called the complaint. Mm -hmm. And so well, the that's the that's a pay. different story too, because I like when we had our foreign exchange student when we paid cash, the price that two oh nine might be forty or fifty or whatever. I don't know, I didn't try it, but had I known I was getting into this mess, I probably would have said, I'll just pay cash. But we don't know that going into it, that I'll be stuck with a $156 bill instead of what's your cash price. And that's pretty common with provision of healthcare that there is a cash price and stuff too. So from a moral hazard, adverse selection standpoint, you can see the perverse incentives that we have for the, the ransom to jack up their prices. So instead of, if this was a, a market price, maybe they would estimate it to be something a lot lower, which kind of reflects their cash price price, right? If you're paying cash, you're not going through insurance, it's this price, but if you're going through insurance, it's this price. And, and so this, this is pretty common in our system. I, I almost disagree a little bit on that, on the market price being substantially different, but this is more of a different reason. I'm thinking overall, It, it's hard on average, I, I agree that there, there's different markets for different types of right. care, and, and so in aggregate, what does it look like or does it even make any sense? Yeah. You know, that, that's, a, that's a question mark. All right, enough on that. I just wanted to share that with you. We can talk later. Let's talk Skalvin, because there's lots of interesting stuff in here to talk about, too. Um, so, wants to start us off. Maybe we should go to the old random number generator. Uh, Michael, number between three and eight? Seven. One, 
two, three, four, five, six, seven, Katie's. What do you want to say about the perversity of Mr. Market? Oh, you don't have a voice? Well, then we'll, we'll go to the next one. We'll have Michael start off. You got lost your voice? Okay, well, don't, don't, we won't even call on you, so you can, you can do sign language or something. <laughs> don't even try. Don't even try. All right, Michael, what was your takeaway? Or um, take points or, or one point? I guess uh, him talking about the stock price is a conservative margin. Um, I read this like three weeks ago, by the way, so um, just trying to catch back up. But um, as he's talking about, you know, prices are quoted each minute on the exchange according to the number of buyers and sellers, um, and so much like every set, every sale or purchase. Even five shares or five million shares, that has an effect on what the price was, and it's now something different, uh -huh. you know? And so, um, as he kind of talks forward, uh, this specifically on the insider buying or selling, like, generally they, they hold, you know, large amounts, um, the people who are inside the company themselves. Um, and so, you know, say they get wind that they should probably unload, stock price get, goes down or anything like that, um, you know, it's it's indefinitely going to go down just because of that, and then it might go down even more. Okay. Um, Let's, I like that margin comment, too. What were the, any other comments on that? I, mean, I found I, that to be one of the most interesting. I think mean, I kind of like the entire comparison to the auction house. It's kind of the rule of the board that we want to comment more yeah. on the individual and how the trade kind of works. Mm -hmm. people on the margin? On the margin, I guess, to what Michael was saying about how, you know, this uh, we're going to hear about the majority of the investors could be buying and holding, but it only gets a few of the buyers and sellers to affect the stock price. Yeah. Yeah, if you really digest that, that that's a neat insight um, to the stock market to think of, if you use the Yahoo example here, uh, even on a large trading day, 140 million shares being traded is still only 10% of the total shares outstanding. So it kind of makes you think a little bit about what the market is on a given day is the people who are trying to sell or buy on a given day. And that's the only shares that are truly at play and subject to the law of supply and demand on that day for that small fraction of the company. That, that puts a different spin on the stock market that all of the shares of the company are not at play in a given day. In fact, it's a very small percentage. Interesting insight to think about marginal analysis in that context of the stock market. Uh, just, I remember this could happen almost any market, not just the stock market, but you know, they, uh, like there were So most of the market is in the buy and hold strategy, thinking about the long-term fundamentals. It kind of makes me feel a little bit better even about that whole strategy in general of buy and hold. If you start thinking about the day-to-day -day action, the day-to-day -day buzz is a small fraction of the actual ownership of those companies on any given day. And so the, the long-run fundamental thing, concept, has all the more, I think, credibility, knowing that that's the way the stock market operates at the margin. The stock market's at the margin with a small fraction of shares at play. If you heard the whole buy and hold thing, that it talked about human action and how you know, that's off, human action is not predictable and oftentimes very unreasonable. So if I'm one of those people doing the buy and hold strategy, I'm basically putting my funds and my home or my money in the hands of these unreasonable people who make no <laughs> 
if you're not in the buy and hold. If you are in the oh. buy and hold, Sam, are you? It's one of those things where you right. trick yourself. You know. But it makes you want to ignore it, right? I mean, knowing the yeah. facts, it makes you feel better like, you know what? I don't have to worry about the price on a given day. If I'm a buy and hold seller, Until it's hit I can kind of ignore the noise. Oh, right, well, if we get into fraud and stuff. Well, like just, in, just crashing the, the, I guess, the company in general. And then it's a diversification argument. Right, it flips. Like, don't have a, don't have your net worth all in one company, Enron. And if you have it in, if you're diversified, then that goes away. Well, Enron also had it had crap weather. To be honest with you, I mean, there was one of those that made people uh, start falling out, and they actually helped start the Enron violence, but this stuff on the books made no sense whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was accounting stuff there, yeah. Big way. What are you trying to say okay. about Big accounts? Yeah. That was accounting. Trying to say it's always a problem. Creative accounting, yeah. All right, good. Is that data? Other comments, thoughts? Can I say about it real quick? No, in general, I can open it up. So, one of the things I wrote about was this take on this expectation. It's like more about expectations than the most recent quarterly earnings report. Uh, mm -hmm. So, it's basically you talk about how an investment is going to be more of a bet on the future. Yeah. Yeah. And how I like the. Something more about the future than the most recent um, yeah, it's more about report. Quarterly yeah, more about expectations than the most recent quarterly report. In other words, we're always kind of thinking more forward-looking on what that today's uh, price is. It really helps you like, dive into giving reasons why we would expect that, which is nice. I think it's a real deep dive into various issues of why we'd expect that short-term volatility. Where was that on? What was your take on that, Foley? I just, you know, taking, uh, you're taking it at a time. Um, I just kind of like it. Uh, you know, you just want to, just want to try to work at a time. Try to do, um, you know, I think you're, you're right. I, you, you're, if you're buying on the rumor, before the news actually comes out to the general public, there might be murmurings of something. Of course, we can get burned on that too, depending on how credible your rumor, and then that's related to inside information. You know, how, you know what, what happened there?
about uh, possibly irrationality. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, I also thought it was interesting on individual reasons for selling. We don't know what the motives are. So if we completely have the rational paradigm of, well, they are trying to maximize profits for the long run for, you know, whatever, for the company. But when we're having a stockholder who might have had a grandma die and they need money for the funeral or something, right? There's all kinds of motives of why they sold. It's like, on paper, why'd you sell? It's a growing company. It's, it's on the upper bottom. Well, I needed the money, right? And so you don't have that as much with the, with the Main Street operation where it's illiquid. Um, they might have to search for other, other things. So you've got different motives of those owners. Okay, Austin, what's your thoughts on this one? Um, you know, I have a few words to respect having the fact that it's an outside kind of financial crisis in the South Very What was your favorite? What do you think about the boat thing? I thought that was kind of interesting for the front. So there's a quote, in the short run, the market is a voting machine. In the long run, it's a winning machine. That's that uh, 30, page 32 at the top. ready to make a decision, moving one direction or not, and cast their vote accordingly on that particular day. It just makes it seem like there's a little bit better than that. Mm-hmm. Right. James Gray was a real hard day. He had to do with that. Yeah, he's kind of the, that's the mad money guy, right? Yeah, that's the guy, yeah. 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 So it's kind of. His support is the, his support is the market, or the market of the economy, or two different things. His uh, tough level of support, he's a Sharply lower, while slower GDP can cause the stock market uh, to rally. Mm -hmm. It's like good news in the economy can be bad news because they're anticipating uh, inflation and all this other stuff. While right. slow GDP, maybe the Fed's going to increase the money supply and put in there to deal with the stock market should go up. Right. So they're really, especially for us today, how we such a I mean, they try to maintain part of their credibility, but the bottom line is when, when they start acting on what they might be doing and the best way that they can have a major impact on the economy is to say they're going to do one thing and then don't do it. 
and that's why the Fed keeps their actions um, failing. They don't, they're not completely transparent, as, as we learned earlier <coughs> in the chapter. So that they, they don't say exactly how much bond buying they're going to do, even if they know it or whatever. The actions that they're taking, they just say, we're going to pursue, we're going to keep interest rates low. Well, what does that mean? Like how long are you going to keep them low? You know, so those details don't come out until uh, the end, or actually quite a long time after uh, it's filed. So the secretness of the Fed is for real on what they do, and they like it that way. Otherwise, they lose power. Um, there was part of this piece on short selling, and I was wondering what you guys knew about that. That's kind of a foggy one for me, even, on how that works. So long selling is buy low, sell high. Okay. Sell stocks you don't own, right, essentially. So um, you guys want me to kind of explain a little bit? about short selling? Right, and you buy them back later. How do you get them, though, in the first place? From a broker. Where does he get them? Yeah, so, it, well, he has, he kind of houses the shares for his other clients. And so, did I forget my markers? No, I have them. So your certificate of 5,000 shares, your broker might you say, might hey, them. Russ, I'm going to take a few for a day. Yeah, exactly. That, that's exactly what goes on, is they, uh, they do a little bit of borrowing. So the... Um, make sure I kind of keep track here. Um, so you've got your broker, and you've got people who really own uh, shares of stock, and so the broker kind of holds them, those stock certificates. In the old days, you used to put them in your, your fire safe, and you'd own the piece of paper, and you'd bring it to your broker and say, hey, I want to sell this, and then they'd take it and, and go. So um, you can think of the broker inventorying these so that they can make sales. They, they keep a brokerage account hey, I know that you own X amount of shares of these particular stocks, right? So they kind of house their portfolio. Then you've got the short seller over here. And the broker can rent. You can think of this as borrowing or renting, kind of like renting a rental property. There's property here. This guy owns, this guy's kind of the landlord. This guy has to agree to allow the broker to do this, but um, that's all kind of part of the agreement, probably in the fine print of the broker's agreement, so they might not even <laughs> completely know what's all going on. But in theory, they, they do. And so they can take that share, and if this is um, a share of a, uh, I don't know, give me a company. What's that? AT&T, all right, so we got AT&T stock and AT&T currently is selling today for a hundred dollars and you think it's going to be worth fifty dollars in the future so this is what you think it's going to be worth fifty so you'd like to take advantage of that downfall expected downfall in the stock so this guy owns AT&T he doesn't want to sell it he's on the buy and hold strategy but this guy wants to try to take advantage of that situation. So he's going to borrow uh, the share. And then he's actually going to sell it today for $100. He's going to have on, this is a terrible, uh, his little balance sheet of the short seller. Now he's got $100 cash. 
but as a liability, he owes one share of AT&T to the broker, right? So he still has that obligation, but it's in the form of a, I owe you a share. I don't owe you a certain amount of dollars, but I owe you a share. So now, if the price is correct and later the stock plummets to 50, now our, our short seller uh, uses $50 of his cash, has 50 left over, and then knocks out his liability so that he now holds zero shares, but he's got 50 bucks cash. So that's kind of the short selling game. What's that? This guy's not happy? It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't, it's not the easiest game to play. And there is, uh, there is um, a lot of risk associated with it. Um, because if the stock price goes up and triples, goes from 100 to 300, oops, I was wrong. I guess that is a pretty strong company. Now look at what happens over here. I've got 100 to buy a $300 stock, and I still have to replace it back. Eventually, it's probably a dead horse, and you need to just top it up. So it's a, it's a, it's a game for um, gamblers, maybe closer to, to Vegas. But, uh, and, and by the way, short selling is not necessarily a bad thing um, at all, in fact. Uh, by having short sellers, it kind of keeps the market prices a little <coughs> more in check. So. Yeah. So yeah, it's not it's not bad in theory, but then we've got the uh, the the history of big brokerage houses, big players in the market now purposely pushing that stock price down so that they can cover their short and make a bunch of money, and then just let it rebound. So then it's back to Wall Street and Gordon Gecko calling up the Wall Street Journal insider that they paid a little bit of money, and the Wall Street Journal person calls their network. We got to watch that. We got to have an econ night or okay. watch Wall Street. Yeah. Uh, I just thought this was a channel. No, I'm not going to watch Wolf of Wall Street. But, uh, but Wall Street's pretty clean, just swearing. I think there's one small news thing, but if she just gets out of bed. But very brief, very brief. So I'm not, nothing too big. So. All right. Um, <laughs> I feel like we're about out of time, but I just wanted to, there was three things, I guess we hit them all, didn't we? Yep. The three economics, uh, econ principles, marginal analysis, expectations, human actions. I thought that was some good insight coming from him, from the econ side of life. So I think we hit all of that, so good, we'll call it a day. Uh, nothing to do this weekend? Uh, no, no. So, oh, but we do have, so Monday, um, read the rest of this to uh, the next two chapter chapters. Nine. Chapter six and seven. Yeah. Six was this seven. six? That was five. This was five? So six and seven. Yeah, six and seven. Cool. Six is pretty short, but six and seven.